Hello everyone, my name is Graham Dudgeon. I'm an industry manager at MathWorks serving the utilities and energy industry. In this presentation, we are going to be looking at some of the techniques we can use when working with large amounts of simulation data. A common challenge is that we have data stored on files on disk which are larger than the available memory on the computer that we are using. It could be that one file is larger than the available memory that you have, or you have a number of files that you've generated through Monte Carlo simulation which, when aggregated, is larger than the available memory. In this situation, we can use memory mapping, where we have a pointer to the file, and once we have the pointer, we can extract only the data we are interested in from the file. For example, I am representing the data contained in two files here by the, the squares, and for example, we just wish to bring in the second row of each file. With memory mapping, we just index in to the files and extract the data that we need, and then we can stitch it together in some way in memory. Another option we have, certainly when we're performing statistical operations, is to bring segments of data in, and then once the data is in memory, we could perform a statistical operation on the data, which will generally reduce that amount of data. For example, if you're taking the mean value of a data vector, or if you're calculating standard deviation, or generating histograms. So let's take a look at a specific example. I am going to be working with data that I generated from a simulation model of the IEEE 123 node test feeder. I would like to acknowledge Bill Kersting's original citation on this test feeder. For more information, you can follow the URL shown here. I previously ran a number of scenarios on the IEEE 123 node test feeder. I ran a thousand scenarios, which generated approximately 76 gigabytes of data that you can see here. And if I go to MATLAB and type memory, then we see here that the physical memory that I have on my machine is 8 gigabytes. And so loading all the data into memory is not an option. So let's take a look now at how we can start working with this data. Contained within this directory, we have 1,000 files for current measurement. You can see each file here is just over 37 megabytes. I'll just scroll down. So you see 1,000 files for that. We also have 1,000 files for each of the, the onload tap changers. Then we also have 1,000 files for voltage measurement, just over 42 megabytes each. The first thing we need to do is generate objects which serve as pointers to the files. So we can use the map file function here because we are working with .mat files. And what this loop does is it loops through the 1,000 scenarios and then generates objects which point to those files. Those objects can then be saved and you can reload them later and, and work with the files. So you don't have to run this section of code each time. It just so happens that I have run this previously. It takes a, a few minutes to generate the pointer, so I won't run it here. I will now load up the file objects by double clicking on this file here, file underscore objects. Our objects contained within the parameter H. So if I do H and enter, you can see there it's just scrolled through all of them. I can access these objects by doing dot notation and tab. Tab here I1. So if I just bring this one up, H dot I1, this is the object associated with IMES underscore one. So you can see here properties dot source, it lists the file imes underscore one, and we can also access the variables within that file. In this case, there is one variable called imes, which has 477 rows and 10,001 columns. The columns are associated with time, the rows are associated with the current measurements within the simulation model. To access the data within imes underscore one, I use the object dot notation imes, and let's just say I want the, the first value first row and first column, one comma one. And there's the value, it's a value of zero. But I've not brought in the entirety of that file. I have brought in only that single value. We can take a look at some of the data in more detail. So I can do h dot i1 dot imes, say two comma colon, so the second row. And we can take a look at that. I'll just zoom in. So this data was generated by just random, randomly changing the loads of the test feeder and running through a thousand scenarios with randomly generated load data. So you can see here the currents are, are modifying and step changes in loads are then causing these dynamic responses. What I done for this particular example 
was to index in to the voltage measurements and also the tap settings. And on each iteration, so as I'm looping through each of those thousand files, generating histogram data for each file and then aggregating it. So this is an example of reducing the data. So using a statistical operation, I'm operating on all the voltage measurements and all the tap measurements, and I am then aggregating the data so we can ultimately look at histograms of the measured data. Once you have performed your analysis, you can then generate a report by using Publish. And I wrote a script which would basically just plot out histogram plots of each of the voltage measurements and the tap settings and generate a PDF from this. So if I go here to Publish and Edit Publishing Options, I've selected PDF. You see here the other options, HTML, XML, LaTeX, Doc, PowerPoint, PDF. And usually when you're generating the report, you would go to include code and set that to false so it does not echo the code that you've used in the generation of your report. Because the script you're writing to perform your analysis is also the script you're using for your reporting. And so set that to false so you don't echo your code that's performing the analysis. I've previously run the report. It takes a few minutes to run. So I'll just show you that now. So here's the PDF report. So what we have here are histogram plots of each of the voltages. So here for bus one, we've got phases A, B, and C. And you can see the, the effect of, of tap changing going on. It's most pronounced in phase B here. If I scroll down, then phase B on bus two, phase C on bus three. And so what we have here is a very convenient way of generating a report with multiple plots, which would be extremely difficult to do by hand. If I now press tap profiles, got another section here on the tap settings. So the onload tap changer between buses 9 and 14, you can see how it modified here over all the scenarios. Between bus 25 and 26, phase A and phase B tap settings. Tap settings between bus 67 and 160. And the tap changer between buses 149 and 150 is operating only on phase A, and we can see the, the impact there. So what we have seen here is when you have data contained in files, which is larger than available system memory, you can use memory mapping to point to the data contained within those files. Portions of data can then be loaded into memory by using indexing. The example we saw here was using map files, and we used the map file function in order to generate objects, which, which then pointed to the data within the files. But you can also use our memory mapping capability to benefit from this technique with other file types as well. When you are working with large amounts of data, then statistical operations are typically used in order to reduce that data and make it more manageable. And in order to save time when documenting and sharing your analysis, the automatic report generation capability can be used. Thank you for listening.